In this video, I'd like to talk about one feature of ChatGPT that hasn't gotten so much attention since it was released in November 2022, which is its ability to translate between languages. Um, I was a translator for 20 years, from 1986 till 20, 2005. Um, translating from Japanese to English. And during that time, there was computer translation, there was machine translation, but it was terrible. Um, and I strongly believe that it was not possible for computers to translate well between languages. Only we human beings can do it. So it was a big shock for me in 2016 when Google Translate suddenly got a lot better to see that it could be done reasonably well in many cases, even between languages that are very different in their structure and vocabulary, like Japanese and English. Um, and so since 2016, Google Translate and DeepL and um, what are some others, Bing, Microsoft Translator, Baidu, a lot of different um, translation engines have become available. And um, they're, they're okay. They're okay in many cases, but they're still... Uh, <laughs> it's pretty bad in some other ways. And so um, what was very interesting for me is the fact that ChatGPT, which does not seem to have been designed primarily to be a translator, um, is better in some ways than those other dedicated machine translation systems. So in this video, I want to talk a little bit about, well, first a little bit about the sort of the history, the basic t types of machine translation that have existed. Um, and then what I see as a you know, human translator is the reason why machine translation has been very difficult. And then show you some examples of how machine translation um, is better with ChatGPT in some ways. And my, my ideas about why it's better in that regard. So uh, first of all, um, the history of machine translation. Now you can Google this, or you can whatever search engine you prefer. You can ask G -G -G Chat GPT about this; it will probably be able to tell you. Um, but um, uh, basically, it's gone through several eras, and so I think, it's, according to what I've read, back in the 1950s, um, when the very, very first computers were, were coming around, um, people thought they could just sort of write computer programs that would have rules for. Uh, translating words between languages and then converting the grammar, grammatical structure of sentences between languages. That was called rule-based machine translation. Um, it was partly stimulated by the fact that there was a, beginning in the late 1950s and into the 60s, there was a very uh, uh, influential theory of language called generative grammar that looked a lot like a computer program. And so it, it seemed to explain um, link, uh, the grammar of languages as though it was a, a set of these mechanical rules. And, but rule-based translation only worked with very, very limited controlled sets of data. If you try to input a, you know, a, a random text, a real text into it, it was just worthless. Um, and there were two reasons for that. One was that the computers at that time were just too limited. They couldn't handle enough vocabulary. They couldn't have, didn't have big enough memories. But another reason, though, was I think that theory was just inadequate. Um, the human language is more complex than just um, the manipulation of these of these symbolic rules. Um, in the beginning in the 80s, I think it was in the late 80s, um, people started trying a different approach. Computers were much more powerful by that time. And so they had these huge corpuses, sets of texts that had been translated by human beings, these bilingual corpuses. And so they applied statistical techniques to compare these techniques. So they had these, you know, they would have a, a lot of text in English and that had been translated into French, and a lot of text in French that had been translated into English. And they would, the computer would match to find corresponding words and phrases between these two. And if there seemed to be a statistical correlation between, um, you know, a word or a phrase in one sentence in one language and in another, then when it gets a new input, when it's requested to translate something, it would match the words in that way. And it got a little bit better, okay? And so it could be slightly usable in some cases, but it was still pretty bad. Very, very often with statistical translation, 
you, if you put in a real text, you know, a newspaper article, a, a, a manual for operating a, a, a machine or something, um, it was just almost impossible to, to understand what, what, what it was supposed to mean in the, in, if you look at the output of that. And so um, as a human translator by, the, by that time, so I was working full-time translating Japanese to English, I, in my you know, confidence as a human being, <laughs> thought that, well, okay, it's, it's impossible. And, but I had a reason for that. Okay, so the reason I thought that, that machine translation was um, impossible was my own perception of what a good translation and what a mediocre translation by human beings are. And so in both translations by me and by other people. And so um, a mediocre translation, a translation, it might be okay, but it's often awkward um, and maybe difficult to understand, is where it's, the translation is being done word by word, phrase by phrase, sentence by sentence. So there's kind of a one-to-one -one correspondence between the words and the phrases and the sentences and the source language and the target language. Um, and so there is a lot of translation by humans that is like that. Um, and it's often, it often seems strange or it doesn't serve the purpose. Um, it can be misunderstood, even though the words are translated correctly, the meaning is wrong. And so a good translation, in my humble opinion, was one that had an intermediate step. Okay, so the human translator, I thought, was standing in the middle, sitting in the middle, would, would understand the meaning of the source text and convey that meaning in the output text without necessarily thinking about whether there was a correspondence of the words or the phrases. Um, and so I felt as a translator that when I was translating the meaning accurately, I was producing better translations. And I think my clients thought that as well, too. I think I made more money when I produced good translations than when I made um, uh, mediocre translations. And so because of this concept of meaning, okay, it's a, it's a vague concept. It's, it's a little nebulous. Of course, you know, philosophers have been thinking about it for, for centuries. But um, in my conception of it, it was somehow this, these cognitive images that I had in my, in my brain and that um, computers don't have that. Okay, I, they, I think they still don't have that, um, but they, they certainly didn't have that you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. And so that's why it was a big surprise in 2016 when Google Translate got a lot better because it was still not translating meaning. I mean, Google didn't say it was translating meaning, and you could do tests on it to show that it didn't really have any understanding of the text. But this new neural network system that was based on these bilingual corpora was able to do something it was it was pretty good it was pretty good okay it got, it got a lot better and so but in my tests since then since 2016 of google and DeepL and and the other ones they've gotten a little bit better but they haven't gotten a whole lot better okay and in my tests of them they still don't seem to be handling meaning at all and so what was interesting for me, if you've watched my other videos on using machine translation for language learning, um, I, I pointed out how ChatGPT is able to you know, identify the meanings of words in context and is able to give you examples of meanings of words in context. So it, I still don't think it has any kind of you know, understanding of the real world, but it, it's able to imitate that pretty well with regard to words. And so I was very interested to see how well it can translate meaning, so not words, but meaning between languages. And so I'm gonna give you just a, two examples, okay, um, of where it is clearly superior to the existing machine translation engines. Um, and the reason it's superior is that it has something, it has this meaning conceptual of meaning. So the first case is, um, I don't expect you to know Japanese. I'm going to be using examples of Japanese to English translation, but I want to first explain some, a couple of, one feature of the Japanese language, how it's different from English. So you can see how that is difficult to translate for, well, it's difficult for, very difficult for computers, and it's often difficult for human beings too. So here's an example of a paragraph in English from a newspaper article, and it's about 
this woman. So the first sentence has the topic. You know, it's this woman, Catherine Schwarzenegger Pratt. And you can see when you write a paragraph about a person in English, you might give the person's name in the first sentence. And then for the rest of the paragraph, you use pronouns. Okay, so I mean, traditionally it's been, you know, it's, it's a male person, you use ma masculine pronouns, um, female, uh, feminine pronouns for, for, for a female, plural pronouns for a plural subject, uh, you use it for an inanimate subject. Of course, now I understand that, you know, pronoun usage is evolving in the case of English, but still that you are consistent in any case, okay? So you, um, and so that this is what this, uh, so this example from the New York Times is they use all feminine pronouns, her, her, she, she, um, to refer to this woman as a subject. Well, Japanese is different. Japanese has pronouns, but it doesn't use them very much. Um, and so, if I were to put that paragraph into into English, I mean into, into Japanese style English. So in Japanese, this paragraph would look something like this. So where those pronouns had existed in the Japanese, they're, they're, uh, in the English, they're just omitted in the in the uh, Japanese. Um, and so it's it's. Uh, from an English speaker's point of view, it looks kind of strange, okay? But it's actually, it's not, you know, if you know Japanese, it's, it's natural, it's not hard to understand. You, you know from the context, you know who you're talking about, okay? But that's because we understand the meaning. We, as human beings, understand the context of what we're reading. Computers haven't been good at that, okay? And so if, here's an article, a very similar <laughs> news article in Japanese about a actress. Well, her name is uh, Mizuno Miki. And you see, I've highlighted her name in the Japanese, okay? And there are no pronouns for the rest of it. So the rest of the sentences are all about her, but they don't, they use her name once or twice, but they don't use the pronouns at all. Um, it's not necessary in Japanese, okay? So what happens if we run this, a paragraph like this, into, into English through a machine translator? Well, Here's what Google Translate did with it, okay? And so it begins, first of all, the introduction of this paragraph was kind of a general statement. Um, it's, it's, it's translated here as a person who has steadily walked his own path at his own pace. When I look back on actor Mizu Mizuno's words, those words come to mind. Okay, so first of all, um, Google Translate misidentified her name as as, a, as being a, a masculine name, so they've given a, a male uh, pronoun to that, which um, actually not all names in Japanese are clearly marked for gender, um, and so it could maybe her name could be a, a, a masculine name as well too. But what I want to point out is if you look at the rest of the paragraph, it's inconsistent. So we get the, he entered the entertainment world after he received, and then we get we get a few lines down. We get we, okay. So in other words, there was a clause in Japanese that didn't have a subject, and it interpreted that as, it gave it, we as the subject. And then it becomes her. Okay, later on we get her, and then we go back to his again. And so you see what Google Translate is doing, is it's translating sentence by sentence. And it, it comes to a sentence that has no subject marked, has no, it's not clear what the subject is, and so it has to put in a pronoun. This is one sign of, of machine translation from Japanese into English is that the subjects are strange. You get all these it as a subject or I as a subject or they as a subject when it doesn't make sense in the context. And so here it's going sentence by sentence and mixed it all up. Being Microsoft Translator, which is in general is not quite as good as Google for Japanese and English, and it has the same problem, okay? It's, it's his and then she, it's her and then his. It goes back and forth, okay? Well, what about ChatGPT? Well, ChatGPT, first of all, that introductory clause, so a person, here it's a person who has steadily walked their own pace on their path. So th these are, the author of this article began with this sort of a general statement, okay? And so they're using the, the modern <laughs> use of the verb, of the pronoun they to refer to a singular indeterminate person, okay? And so that's, you know, 100 years ago, people didn't do that in English, but now it's, it's very common and accepted. So that was good. So not his, not, he did not default to his 
as being the pronoun for a, for a person of indeterminate gender. It devolved to they. And then the rest of the paragraph is all she. She, she, her, 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 her. It's consistent. Okay. I've done, um, I don't know, about a dozen tests like this of comparing um, paragraphs that were, that have the, don't have the gender pronouns in Japanese and seeing if, if chat GPT and the others are consistent. Sometimes Google Translate gets it right. Sometimes DeepL, which is another good, uh, reasonably good machine translation system, gets it right. But they're, they're more, wrong more often than they're right. Well, in every test I've done, where there's enough context for a human being to figure out what these pronouns are supposed to refer to, ChatGPT got it right. Okay, so it seems to be grasping the meaning to some extent. Okay, the um, you know one of the things ever since machine translation was first started to be developed, I think the the computer engineers and the linguists developing it were often in conversation with, especially the academics, were probably often in conversation with, with literature specialists, okay? So in, in the academic world, translation is often, the focus of translation studies is on literature more than anything else. Um, and so people would say, well, you won't be able to translate Shakespeare, you won't be able to translate poetry with, with computers. Computers can't get that feeling of that. And so um, I think the <laughs> Somewhat defensively, the the computer developers um, have said, "Well, we, we we know we won't be able to do that." So it's it's been a trope in the in this discussions of machine translation for decades, as far as I'm aware, is saying, "Well, we won't be able to do translate poetry. Computers won't be able to translate um, great literature." but they will be able to translate text for practical purposes. So I don't think the developers of machine translation have even um, tried to do that. I, I, don't, I don't get any sense that, so, and in fact, Google Translate and DeepL and all those others have been really bad. And if you put a poem through them, or if you put a song lyrics through those machine translations or novel excerpts, especially if the novel includes conversation, it's really bad, okay? So here's an example um, of a novel excerpt. This is from a 1977 short story that I'm almost positive has not been translated into English. I just found it in a collection that I happen to have. Um, and it's a beginning of a story about a man is, a man is home and he has a cold. He's, he's a doctor and a patient comes to the door and his wife come, comes to see him. So there's this description of the of the events and a little bit of a conversation between the man and his wife. I ran that through DeepL this time. Um, and I'll put this translation in the, in the, in the, in the um, comment section of this video so you can read it if you want to, but it's really hard to figure out. Okay, you, you can, some of the sentences look make sense. Some of the sentences are, as sentences are translated correctly, but if you try to follow what's going on in this story, you just can't figure it out. Okay, and so the wrong person is identified as saying things, and there are these really strange things that are that are said. Oh, Google Translate was bad as well too. Bing was also bad in this regard. And I've tried a number of other novels translating from Japanese to English, especially if there's conversation. It's horrible. But then I tried ChatGPT. Okay, um, it's a lot better. Okay, it's, there's still there are mistakes in here. There are mis in the sense that um, the subjects of some of the sentences are wrong. Okay, but if you read this, you will see that the the, the conversation sounds more like natural conversation, and I think you can get the gist of what's going on in this scene. And the uh, other tests I've done have been similar. Okay, so that the other conventional machine translation engines have been just horrible for for translating literary texts. Well, ChatGPT does a pretty good job with a lot of them. So well that I could, you know, I could almost see that if you had some, you know, entertainment novels, you know, mysteries or romance novels or something like that in Japanese or in English, and you could translate them with ChatGPT into the other language and, you know, have some editor go through and make, do some light editing. And it would, might almost be readable. You could almost be entertained by it. While the other ones, the dedicated machine translation engines were just terrible. Okay, so that, so these two examples 
of the translating pronouns or being able to use the correct pronouns based on the context and being able to sort of grasp the nebulous <laughs> a meaning of a story, of a, a narrative, suggests that ChatGPT and presumably the other um, large language models that are starting to appear now, you know, have our, our, can have the potential to be better <laughs> translators because they're translating this meaning, something like meaning. And so it'll be very interesting to see what happens. Um, so if, if you are using, or if you have a need to translate something from between languages, in many ways, the, the conventional systems, even if they're, they're um, not as good in some ways as I've shown you here, um, they are better in other ways. Okay, so the, for example, they will often handle um, technical vocabulary better than uh, ChatGP does. Also, ChatGPT, as you know, if you've used it, um, depending on the prompt you give it, you get can get very, very different responses depending on how the prompt is phrased. And also you get different answers every time. So with you put in the same text input into Google Translate, then this, you get the same output, exactly the same for weeks or months even until the engine is, is updated. Well, ChatGPT is a little bit more probabilistic. And so um, whether that's good or bad will depend on your on your application, but it, it does mean that that, ch that they're a little bit more reliable, the conventional ones. Also, in a couple of cases, I've, I asked ChatGPT to translate a speech. It was a speech in Japanese, and I asked it to translate it into English. And about halfway through the speech, it kind of started writing its own speech, okay, which was maybe better than the original. But I don't think that's what you want it to do in most cases, okay? So ChatGP is, of course, can also write. It writes very well in, in some sense. But translation is not writing something original. You still need to stay, you know, close to the original text in some sense. So um, at this point in February 2023, um, I would not recommend using ChatGPT for for important machine translation things, but I think it does show that um, the potential that these large language models to have to make machine translation um, even better. So that's those are my thoughts about translating with ChatGPT. If you have any comments, please leave them in the comments. I um, mean, when I think of something else to talk about, I'll come back and make another video. So thank you all for listening.